our God, ruler of the universe. Lord, we praise your name and we thank you, Lord, for another Shabbat. We ask, Lord, that you would bring us up into your presence, surround us with your rainbow, surround us with your heavenly angels, put aside out of our minds all the troubles of the week, and may we focus on you and on your love. In Yeshua's holy name, amen. Our study this week is out of 2 Kings chapter 13, Jehoaz, King of Israel. And so in our chart here, we've been moving along through the kings. Uh, the, below the line is the kings of Judah. And uh, we've just covered Joash, or a little bit of Joash, down at the bottom. And then up in the north, that's the northern tribes, the tribes of Israel, the ten tribes of Israel. And we've gone through many kings with them and many dynasties already. Uh, we had the Jeroboam dynasty and the Baasha dynasty and Zimri and then Omri dynasty with Ahab. And, and now we're in the Jehu dynasty. Uh, in the southern kingdoms, uh, they just went one dynasty, the Davidic dynasty. From David on through. But in the north, uh, they kept on changing. And so Jehu uh, killed off all of Ahab and his family, all of Ahab's descendants. And now he has died and his son Jehoaz. And that's where we're at. Uh, Elisha is still alive. Elisha has been alive uh, through several of these kings. Elisha was alive in Ahab's time and, um, and Jehoshaphat's time. And so uh, Elisha has a, had a long ministry and, uh, and is still alive at this point in our study. Okay, so a little background there. And now just a little review. Backing up into 2 Kings chapter 11. Jehoaz, as he was sometimes known, also known as Joash, was seven years old when he became king of Judah. That's the one in the south, a seven-year-old king, and he reigns 40 years in Jerusalem. So that's a long time. He's going to reign uh, throughout the time of some of the kings uh, that were in the north. And by the 23rd year of the king Jehoaz, same Jehoaz, Joash, same one, the Kohanim had not repaired the damages of the temple as the king commanded. And that we studied this another time in the past, I think last week or whatever. But uh, again, I'm just bringing that up. It says in the 23rd year of his kingdom. And actually when we were talking about that, uh, I kind of referenced it as that he was 23 years old. And that was inaccurate. So he had been king 23 years, so he would have been, what, 30 years old at that time when it hadn't been repaired yet. And uh, we don't know when he gave the command to repair the temple, to collect the funds and, and bring in funds for the, for the repairing of the temple and then for it to be used for that. But by his 30th birthday, and by his 23rd year as king, I uh, had not been done yet. And then we bring it back to that and reference it that because we're going to now see that in relation to the king in the north, King uh, Jehoaz. Okay, so in the 23rd year, it's now in 2 Kings 13, in the 23rd year of Joash, son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, that's the one we were just talking about, that seven-year-old boy king, in his 23rd year as king. So when he was 30 years old, the same year when, it, when he, he, he got fed up with the Kohanim not collecting the money, that same year, that's when Jehu died, and Jehoaz, the son of Jehu, became king over Israel in Samaria, and reigned 17 years. So in the south, they're worshiping the Lord, they're, rebuild, they're re, uh, refurbishing the temple and, and, and fixing up the temple and, and, and so that they can have the services and they're dedicated to God and, and they're collecting offerings and offerings came in in abundance. And so in the south, they were serving the Lord and, and, uh, and doing well. And now we're gonna see what's going on in the north. Same time period, right? 23rd year of Joash's Reign, okay, so we saw what happened in the south and now in the north. This guy comes along, he only reigns 17 years. So, uh, so we have that in relation to, uh, to Joash. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who had made Israel sin, and he did not depart from them. And so now it references all the way back. We saw that chart with all those different kings that we've already looked at and all those different dynasties in the north. And it says he's still following the sins of Jeroboam. Jeroboam was the first king of the north, the one who broke off 
after Solomon. Um, and so Jeroboam was the one who broke off, and so it's going all the way back to him. He's still following those same sins of Jeroboam. And in some ways that's good, because it could have referenced back to Ahab. Ahab and his children, they followed the sins of Ahab, which brought in Baal worship. And then Jehu comes through and gets rid of the Baal worship, or slays the, uh, the Baal, annihilates the Baal temples, and destroys the Baal uh, idols, and, and, uh, and kills off the Baal priests, and uh, again kills off Ahab's family. And so then it reverts back, not as bad as Baal worship, to the worship of the golden calves that Jeroboam had made, one in the north and, and, and one uh, still in the northern side, but one way up in Dan and one, I forget what the other one was, might have been Samaria, but wherever it was. And, uh, and so they revert back to that. Not all the way back to serving God, but to the sins of Jeroboam and following that way. Uh, and in that, it's, it's uh, again, the Baal worship was totally sold out for Baal, but Jeroboam, these golden calves, Jeroboam said that these are the calves that brought you, these are the gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And so they're still referencing it to the true God, the God who took us out of Egypt, the God who created, but saying they're, they're in this form of the golden calves. And so in some ways that's more dangerous, I guess. It's, it's, it's kind of a pseudo, you know, trying to mix the two together, which is very dangerous. But it's different, and that's the point I'm trying to make, whether better or worse, but it's different than sold out Baal worship, totally something different, and sacrificing their kids to an idol and, and all things like that. Um, and so that's what's going on there. And so it refers back, and, uh, all the way back to Jeroboam, the son of Nabat. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he delivered them into the hand of Ahazel, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Adad, the son of Hazel, all their days. So for a long time, they're, they're, uh, they're under the oppression of Syria, two, these two different kings, the king and his son, and uh, because they don't have the protection of God. Jehu started a great uh, reformation, but didn't take it far enough. Got to the people where they were comfortable. We're kind of feeling comfortable now. Okay, we've, we've left total foreign worship away from you, but we're, we're, we're coming back, but we'll just come back a little bit. Come back halfway, half back. You know, the, not a total repentance, not a total return. We're back to comfortable, okay, this is what we've been doing here in, in the north for a long time, and we're kind of comfortable with that. And it still references all the way back to Egypt and Moses, and so, so we like that, and the references to that. And so it feels comfortable, but it's still not right. And so they are not under the protection of God, and so the Syrians are able to come in, and God delivers them into their hand. So Jeho, Jeho, Jehoaz pled, pleaded with the Lord. And the Lord listened to him, for he saw the oppression of Israel by the king of Syria. So this is very interesting. So this is not just he's not going to the golden calves. When it says the Lord, it's referring obviously to the Lord God, the one who, who didn't protect them from, from Syria, because now he's listening to them. And the golden calves can't listen, right? They're just idols. They're just... Images, right? So he's talking about the real God, the Lord God, the God Almighty, and he's crying out to the true God. He's woken up a little bit here. He's seen, okay, this, was, this is wrong. We, we're not following God, and this is why we're experiencing the problems we're experiencing. And so he turns to God, turns to the Lord God, and cries out to him and pleads to him for help. And God is ever ready to hear our cry. No matter how far we've gone, no matter what we've gotten ourselves into, whether, again, totally horrible stuff or even just mixed bad stuff. <laughs> Mixing the good with the bad, which, again, sometimes is even more dangerous because we don't sense how bad we're at. And this calamity comes and cry out to the Lord. And this king cries out to the Lord, and the Lord hears. The Lord's instant, ready to hear. When I say instant, that doesn't mean God all of a sudden, when he, we cry out, he instantaneously solves all our problems, but he's instant in hearing our cry. And he knows the timing and what's best for us in, in, in helping us out and, 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 and drawing us ever closer to him. And so the Lord hears him. The Lord hears him instantly. And the Lord is concerned for the oppression that they're going through. God doesn't like it. God is not happy when he sees the oppression happening, but it was their choice. And some of the problems that we experience, it's because of our choices that we have made. 
Some of it's because of, directly because of the choices we made. Sometimes it's because of the choices we've made that we've gone out from under God's protection. And Satan has been able to come in and harass us even more than he would be able to do otherwise. Because we've sold himself, ourselves out to him. So he, God doesn't like to see that. God doesn't like to see even when he uses these things to help draw us back to him. He doesn't like to see us suffering. He doesn't like to see us oppressed. But because he's a just God, because he obeys his own laws, because he gives us freedom and freedom to choose, and because he knows that sometimes, for some of us, or for all of us, at certain times in our life, uh, getting our attention through these type of means works for his honor and glory to get us to eternal salvation. But he's not happy when we're being oppressed. He's not happy when we're being uh, persecuted. He's not happy when we're going through struggles and trials and tribulations. He's not happy when we're, we're sick or, or, or troubled. And so he sees the oppression and his heart is touched with it. And so when the king cries out, he is wanting to and he's ready to listen. He's been wanting to hear. He's been moving. He's been sending his spirit to, to, to move upon this king's heart to draw him to you, to him. And so that's why the king responded. The king only responded because God's spirit moved upon his heart. And the only reason that any of us respond to God in any way, shape, or form is because God moved upon our hearts. The only reason any of us do any good at all is because God has moved on our hearts. Even those who don't believe in God, even those who hate God, the only reason they do any good at all is because God has moved and done something through them. And so God has first moved here. God is uh, moving on his heart. And God has allowed the oppression to come to wake the guy up. And it's working. And he cries out to the Lord. And that's exactly what the Lord's been waiting for and wanting. And he's instant to hear. And he listens to his call. And he listens to our cry. He listens to our pleas, pleadings. He listens to, to our hearts. He listens to our prayers. He's ever ready and ever wanting to hear and answer our call. So in verse 5, the Lord gave Israel a deliverer so that they escaped from under the hand of the Syrians. And the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before. Freedom, dwelling in tents, not having to be bottled up in a walled city, able to go out by the farms and go out into the countryside and go back out to their plots of land that had been designated to them since the time of Moses and, and go out and, and uh, live in their tents. Peace and prosperity. No locks needed. God sent a deliverer, and they were delivered from the oppression of the Syrians. Now, it's interesting. I mean, God sent, the Lord gave Israel a deliverer. Very specific, and does this wonderful thing. Deliverance from the hand of the Syrians. And it doesn't even tell us the name of the deliverer. That's kind of interesting. It's kind of this unnamed deliverer that God uses to come in and work his deliverance. And again, any good that's done by anyone is done because the Lord has worked through it. So whether this deliverer is the Lord himself, which it very well can be, God stepping in in human form and, and doing whatever, it doesn't even tell us. It doesn't even go into a long story of what, how he did it. How did the deliverance take place? It doesn't even tell us. That's all it tells us. That's the only verse on it. But God steps in, whether coming in human form, as he did, he came and spoke to, to Abraham, and, and uh, he met with Joshua, and many times throughout the scriptures, he came and met directly with his people and helped us out. The angel of the Lord, and various different uh, descriptions of him in, in ministering and working. Could have been an angel, he could have sent an angel. Could have used a human being but it still would have been God working through that human being. God sent a deliverer. And that's what God's waiting for. So we cry out to send his deliverer for us in our behalf. And God has sent us the deliverer. Amen. And again, whether this was the deliverer in human form at that time or not, God did send our deliverer to deliver us out of the hand of bondage out of the bondage of sin, out of the bondage of the slavery of sin, and the, 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 out of the 
the, the bondage of, of habits and corruptions of our selfish heart and set us free. He's come to set us free, to make us free indeed. The whole Passover experience, very true story, very powerful story, listed over and over again, remembered over and over again throughout the scriptures. Because it's so important, because it shadowed God's deliverance in our lives. Freeing us so that we can worship him freely. So we wouldn't be bound under Satan's rule anymore. And we wouldn't be bound under our carnal, selfish nature that we're born with. We're naturally born with. It's impossible in our own strengths to do any good at all. It's only because God has sent the deliverer to set us free, to break Satan's hold, that we're able to do any good. Since Adam and Eve sold us out, and chose to follow the Hasatan, to chose to follow the, the, uh, the persecutor of God's people, the murderer from the beginning, the liar from the beginning, the adversary of God. Since humanity was sold out under to him, we've taken on his nature and follow his dictates. And we are in bondage to him. We are born under his banner. And that is why God sent the Deliverer. That's why God sent the Messiah. That's why God sent the Mashiach. To set us free from that bondage. That's why he gave Adam and Eve the sacrificial system. That's why he gave Moses the temple service and the sacrificial system within that. So that we could have that forgiveness of sins. So that we could be delivered from that bondage. Because Adam and Eve, God told Adam and Eve, you sin, you die. The wages of sin is death. But God has sent the deliverer to stand in our place and to die in our place. So that the price has been paid. So that Satan's hold over us is then broken. <coughs> and God has bought us and redeemed us back from that bondage. So that we can worship him freely and truly, that he, we can have his heart and his mind and then begin to be recreated back into his image. And so the very thing that Adam and Eve gave up, the very thing that they lost, God is restoring through the deliverer so that we can dwell in tents again, so we can Sukkot in him, that we can dwell in him, that we can rest in him and him dwell with us in peace peace of mind, and peace of heart, and peace of soul. God has sent a deliverer. It says free from the oppressive enemy. Because Satan is an oppressive taskmaster. Comes along seeking whom he may devour and, and, and shows us delights. Gets us hooked. It's like a fisherman, right? Puts a nice looking bait on there and there's a hook underneath. That's what he does. Looks nice, seems appealing. <coughs> Whether it's the lust of the eye or the lust of the flesh or the pride of life, he appeals to vanity, he appeals to boasting us up and lifting us up, or he appeals to our, our, our natural desires or our nature, appeals to our emotions. He tweaks those and works on those, paints it all pretty, and once he gets us hooked, he is an oppressor. And then we're in slavery to him, in bondage to him. Not able to be set free. Just like we couldn't leave Egypt. Just like they couldn't be set free from the Syrian army. Unless God sent a deliverer. And thank God he has sent a deliverer in our behalf to set us free. And that's what God did for King Jehoah. Verse 6, nevertheless, they did not depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who had made Israel sin, but walked in them, and the wooded image also remained in Samaria. I don't know what that wooden image is referred to, because the calves were golden, I believe. And so I'm not sure what that wooden image is, but that remained there. So was oppressed, 
cried out to God, God works the deliverance, and they stay in their sins. That is not the gospel. God is not just powerful enough to forgive. God is not just powerful enough to free us. God is powerful enough to forgive us, to free us, and to keep us free. To deliver us. Change us. Transform us. That's what God is powerful enough to do. And a lot of people don't believe that. Just this week, um, I was on Facebook for some reason. I don't know. I hardly ever go there. It's a stupid thing, that thing is, I'll tell you. <laughs> but, uh, but I had to go there for something. I think someone wanted to be my friend. And I didn't befriend them. I think they'd get insulted. So whatever. I went on there. And so while I was there, I looked at a couple of things. And, and another friend uh, had posted something. And then it had some friends who responded to his post. And one guy responded to his post that had nothing to do with what he originally posted. And I think that's one of the things that's done there. I mean, I don't know. You know everyone uses a soapbox or whatever, right? And, uh, and I tried hard not to respond. <laughs> I mean, I, I scrolled through the rest and read everyone ate for breakfast and supper and saw their pictures of their meal and all this kind of stuff. You know, scrolled and tried to, you know, but I, and my thought kept coming back to that. And what the person wrote was, he said, uh, it's impossible to keep God's law Again, it had nothing to do with what my friend wrote, but it's impossible to keep God's law. Uh, we cannot do it. We're just human. But praise God, he has sent the Savior. Praise God, he has sent the Deliverer. Praise God, we are forgiven. And, and, and God just wants us to strive and do better. Uh, yeah, absolutely nothing to do with what my friend wrote. Absolutely nothing. But, uh, but he put that in there. And, and so I just felt like I had to respond to that. And, uh, and so I wrote some along the line uh, so God can give us victory. It is possible to keep God's law. That would be a mean God who would give us his law and not give us the power to keep it. It'd be like dangling a carrot in front of their face and then hitting them with a stick to try and get them to catch the carrot always just strive to do better and God just give us his law so that we can try harder. Give us a goal to reach that we can never reach. That's cruelty. That's satanic. That's horrible to do that to somebody. Put something just out of their reach and they can, but tell them they got to keep on striving for it. Yeah. That's what a lot of people believe. A lot of people believe that. A lot of people who read the Bible believe that. Those who don't read the Bible think, well, their job is just to do good, just to be as good as they can, you know, when it's convenient. And those who believe the Bible, a lot of them will believe that and are taught that. We can't keep it, but it's there, so just do the best you can. That is bondage in itself. That is legalism in itself. A lot of people think keeping God's law is legalism. That's not legalism. That's righteousness. Legalism is trying to keep God's law in your own strength and never really believing you'll ever get there anyway. So then you're not really ever trying, are you? Because you don't really believe you'll ever get there. The same God who gave us his law is able to so transform us, forgive us, cleanse us of the past and righteousness, Fill us with his spirit to empower us to change. And again, recreate us into his image, with his mind, with his heart, with his desires, with his power. Not our own power, but his power working in us and through us to give us full victory and complete victory over every sin that he reveals to us. Now, thankfully, he doesn't reveal them all at once. That's why it's a growing process. He reveals a sin. And then he gives us victory over that sin. When we have victory over that one, he reveals another one, and he forgives us and convicts us, and we confess, and, and then he gives us victory over that one, and that's how the process continues. 
It's like whatever, you know, growing in school, you know, they teach you in kindergarten, whatever, one thing, and then they add to that, and add, first counting, and then adding, and then subtracting, and then multiplying, and, you know, little by little, showing them more. You showed a kindergartner, you know, trigonometry, he'd forget it, you know? And so God doesn't reveal all our sins at one time, but he takes us step by step. That's why it's a growing process. That's why the sanctification process, the being made holy process, takes the work of the lifetime. But throughout that time, God is giving us victory over every sin that he reveals to us. Every sin he convicts us of. Not every sin that he convicted your neighbor of, not every sin that he connected, convicted your spouse of, and that, that, and that spouse is telling you that you got to, you know. But every sin that he convicts you of, that he's working in your heart, he will give you the power and the victory over. Because I can't give you the power and victory over it. Your spouse can't give you the power and victory over it. Your neighbor can't give you the power and victory over it. Your parents can't give you power and victory over it. We can nag each other. We can harass each other. But God who convicts also gives the power to have victory over the sin. Thus we can walk in newness of life. And all things become new. And he can make us victorious in him. And that's the gospel that has been missing. That's the, the missing gospel, the missing link. I think that's why so many people who, who are taught the Bible or whatever, leave God. They say, this is ridiculous. I'm chasing a carrot I can never reach. And I'm getting hit at the same time while I'm doing it. That's true. And it's a miserable experience. And they say, forget it. I'll just go eat the carrot and be happy by yourself. Or just forget about the carrot. <laughs> I'm just going to go and be happy. And then the ones that are still stuck in it. It's a miserable experience. It's not a victorious experience. And it doesn't shadow God. It doesn't give glory to God. Doesn't reveal God. Because we got people professing to believe in God and sinning left and right. And not living for God at all. Because, hey, they can't gain victory anyway. So why try? And then they say, well, don't condemn me. I can't keep the law anyway. So we send a totally horrible picture of God with that doctrine. I mean, he's given us this law, but we can't keep it. That would be absolutely horrible. Again, that would be like giving a kindergarten kid a test that there's no way they could possibly pass and then punishing them for not passing it. Or saying, well, it doesn't matter anyway. <laughs> so you got a zero. You didn't know any of the trigonometry. It doesn't matter. <laughs> then tomorrow I'll give them another trigonometry test. And they fail that one. No, oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Nothing matters. It's okay. As long as you come to class, that's all that matters. You just show up in class. That's all that counts. That's what they're doing. And if you come once a month or once a year, that's okay too. You know, just every so often check in, that's okay. <laughs> as long as at one time in your life you said you liked school, that's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll pass you. And that's the picture of God that they're sending for. Now we have a loving God who has given us righteous laws, good laws that are for our own good, for the good of humanity. And then he fills us with his spirit. He's given us his spirit to empower us, to want to do those laws, and to love those laws. When we have his mind and his heart, we love it. We want to do it. It becomes a joy to do it. It's all the difference in the world. You know, it's like the, the bachelor. He doesn't want to take out the garbage. He doesn't care about the garbage. He doesn't want to do the laundry. It doesn't matter. You know? But then he meets somebody. <laughs> Oh, and now he's glad to take the garbage out. See, it's a at least until after they get married. But, you know, I mean, it's this, this joy that comes in. That's because, again, the spouse can't give you the power to do it. But, uh, but God does. And so then God gives us the joy to want to do it and the power to do it. And when we have the power to do it, it makes it a lot more joyful, too. And he gives us the victory. And he removes the desire for the other stuff, the bad stuff. And so then doing it becomes more joyful as well. When we're just trying to do it in our own strength, it's burdensome. It's a burden. It's bondage. It's oppression. It's, they were under the oppression of the Syrians. It's oppressive. That's where the law becomes oppressive if we try and do it in our own strength. We make up our own laws. That's oppression. That's legalism. That's bondage. 
And that's dead end street. But that's not what the Bible says. That's not how God is. God has given us righteous laws. And the Bible specifically says, and his laws are not burdensome. Why? Well, pretty heavy to carry. Well, but his yoke is easy. And he's carrying it with us. He's walking with us. And he's carrying the load. And we're walking along with him. So thus, his burdens are light. So we walk with him. We allow him to carry our burden. We surrender it all to him. Walk in his love. Walk in his power. And unfortunately, this king was taught the false gospel. The partial gospel. The easy to listen to gospel. And he fell for it. Cried out in his stress and distress. God heard him and answered and delivered him. And then he continued doing what he was doing before. Maybe some of us have fallen into that category. Maybe all of us have fallen into that category at some point in our lives. We're going through some problem, some, some great place in our lives, some difficult time. And we cried out to God. And God heard immediately, and God answered. And God delivered us from that. Whatever the situation was, a problem with our neighbor, a problem with our boss, a problem with an employee, a problem with our tenant or our landlord, a problem with a spouse, a problem with some kid, a problem with our parents, a problem with some mechanical thing, or a problem with our house, we cried out to God. And he worked out an answer, and he solved the problem, and then we forget to even thank him. And then we just continue on doing what we were doing. And not giving him the honor and glory and praise. And not surrendering any more to him. Not walking in his light. And just going back as if it never happened. Ignoring his goodness. Trampling on his grace. Spurning his mercy upon us. Thankfully we have a God who forgives. And a God who cleanses. And a God who redeems. And a God who delivers. And is able to totally deliver us. And so if any time in our life, even in far past, that applied to any of us, it probably applies to all of us. We can ask God's forgiveness and claim the forgiveness for that. And thank him for forgiving us. And ask him to set us on his path and to keep us on his path. To commit ourselves to him. And surrender fully to him. And allow him to empower us and move us and walk us in his path and his life. And then make choices every day to stay to that commitment. Every day he gives us a free choice. Every day he says, well, do you want to follow me still? Do you want to continue to walk with me? Or do you want to go back the way you were? Every day. Several times through the day. And then we need to continually make that right choice. To follow him. And to stay with him. This king made a right choice. Cried out to God. He didn't stay with that right choice. We have to continually make that choice to choose God. God gave that choice to Adam and Eve. He's not going to take that choice away from us either. Gave that choice to this king. And unfortunately, he didn't stay with it. To make the choice. Something that God gives us the freedom to do. And even that is sometimes very difficult. It's always very difficult. But even that, we can pray and ask God to give us the power to make the right choice. If you're wavering in making that right choice that day at that time, say, God, help my unbelief. God, help me choose. God, give me the power to make the right choice and surrender the choice over to God. And he will come in and empower the choice as well. But that's our part, making the right choice. I'll leave that final decision up to us. And so the, it says, he left the army of Jehoahaz only 50 horsemen, 10 chariots, 
That's not very many. Whole army, 10 chariots. Only 50 horsemen and 10,000 foot soldiers. For the king of Syria had destroyed them and made them like the dust at threshing. I don't know who the he is. He left of the army of Jehoaz, Jehoaz, only 50 horsemen. I don't know if that's referring to God. <laughs> that God left him that way. Or if the king of Syria left him that way. But either way, he wasn't left with much. And his golden calf kings weren't able to deliver him much and help him much. Their gods, his gods, and his wooden pole or whatever that was, wasn't able to help him much. And then in verse 9, Jehoahaz rested with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria. And then Joash, his son, reigned in his place. In the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehoahaz, became king over Israel in Samaria and reigned 16 years. It's getting real confusing here, right? <laughs> At this point in time, we have two kings over two kingdoms with the same name. Both Jehoaz. And sometimes known as Joash. Both of them sometimes known as Joash, and both of them sometimes known as Jehoaz. For this short period of time here. And that's where we're coming to. And so there we have it on the chart. Jehoahaz in the north and top, Jehoahaz. His son, Jehoash, also known at times as Joash, reigning at the same time. The 37th year of Joash in the southern kingdom, Judah, who's also known at times as Jehoash. <laughs> That's where we're at. So we have this king there. He reigns for 16 years or whatever it was, and 17 years, something like that. And all it really said about him was that uh, the evil cried out to the Lord. The Lord delivered him. And then he went back to his sins. So as we apply this to our own lives, you're needing deliverance in your life. You're under oppression of some way, shape, or form. Some bondage, some way, shape, or form. Some area that Satan has you down, and some area that you're not following God and struggling to follow God in that area. Or maybe not struggling, just yielding to the sin. God wants to send a deliverer into your life. God wants to send the Messiah into your life, into your heart. He wants to cover you and forgive you and set you free from that oppression, from that sin. And if God has set you free, but then you've gone back into doing that sin again. Maybe not all the way back into Baal worship, or maybe all the way not back into total sin, but still continuing in that sin that at one time he gave you victory over. And you passed in that freedom for a while, but now have gone back to that sin. Whatever it is. God wants to set you free again. And he wants to set you free indeed. Totally free. Come out of Egypt, come out of Babylon, come out of bondage, and be set free. That's what is inviting us to today. Whatever area of our life, whatever part in our life. And so whatever applies to us tonight, whether in some area in the past where God del delivered you and set you free and you went back, or, or you didn't thank him, or maybe something that's current now, or maybe you've had in your mind that it's impossible to keep God's law, and you're seeing the, the glory of the fuller gospel. God is able to set us free and keep us free. And you want to receive that grace. You want to receive that power. You want to receive God's spirit. To give you the power and victory over whatever area in your life. As we pray together. Surrender your heart to him and commit to him. Return to him. As we pray together. Our Lord and our God, ruler of the universe. We are thankful, Lord, for your love and mercy, and your love and mercy even to this king, uh, Jehoahaz. Uh, you knew he wasn't going to turn fully to you, and yet you sent the deliverer for him anyway. Thank you for sending the deliverer for us while we were yet in sin. Thank you for sending your deliverer, sending your son for us in our behalf, even before we knew you. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness that you've granted to us. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for answering our prayers. Thank you for stepping in and helping us as we've cried out to you. Thank you for looking on us with compassion and mercy as you've seen us being oppressed by the enemy, by the adversary. 
Thank you for granting your forgiveness. Thank you for sending forth your spirit. Thank you for sending us the promise of deliverance and full deliverance. Thank you for setting us free, and we claim your freedom right now. Whatever sin you brought to any of our minds right now, we claim your forgiveness, and we claim your power, and we claim your victory. Lord, come in us and give us victory. Totally remove everything out of us that's not of heaven and set us free in you. And work your power in us and through us for your honor and glory. In Yeshua's holy name, amen.